Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Hansen, um, and I am the Speakers Director of the Buckley Program. It is with great pleasure that I am here to introduce a distinguished patron of the liberal arts and scholar of Western civilization, Professor Noel Vallis. She is the Director of Graduate Studies of Spanish here at Yale, um, and also a professor of Spanish and Portuguese. Okay, no longer Portuguese. Um, <laughs> She was a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and also a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. She's written on sacred realism, the Spanish Civil War, and 19th century Spanish novel. So with, without further ado, um, the moderator for this second panel, Liberalism at Home and the Challenges to Western Survival. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? Good. Welcome to the second panel um, uh, on this uh, conference on James Burnham's Suicide of the West, which the William F. Buckley Jr. program at Yale has so beautifully organized and put together. I should point out at once that unfortunately James Pesukukis was unable to attend, but wonderfully at the last moment uh, we have a replacement. Ovik Roy has stepped up and volunteered to fill in for him, <laughs> for which I thank him. <laughs> so our panel now consists of James Taranto, R. R. Reno, and Ovik Roy. My role here after making a few introductory remarks is to introduce our distinguished speakers very briefly, to turn the panel over to them, and then after which we'll open up the floor for discussion. When I accepted Rich and Lauren's kind invitation to moderate this panel, I was genuinely delighted to have the opportunity to revisit Burnham's classic book. But as I started to read, I realized that I was absolutely dead wrong about it. Not about its classic status, but that I had actually read the book before. <laughs> because as I read further, I understood that had I once read his book, I would never have forgotten it. My false memory of having read it probably arose from recognizing the title, a title that surely I must have read decades ago. I would never have forgotten it because as a professor of literature, the first thing I noticed was not so much what he was saying, but how he was saying it. In chapter one, The Contraction of the West, he begins, while working on this book one morning, I happened to come across lingering on a remote shelf an historical atlas left over from my school days long, long ago. I drew it out and began idly turning the pages for no particular reason other than to seize an occasion as a writer will to escape for a moment from the lonely discipline of his craft. This atlas is current to 1914, he says. And a little bit later he writes, leafing through an historical atlas of this sort, we see history as if through a multiple polarizing glass that reduces the infinite human variety to a single rigorous dimension, effective political control over acreage. This dimension is unambiguously represented by a single clear color, red, green, yellow, blue, imposed on a particular segment of the outlying world. The red on Italy, Gaul, Spain, Egypt means Roman rule. The blue means Parthian rule. The uncolored fringes mean the amorphous anarchy of barbarism. Burnham has at once drawn us in, first by using the classic, classic captatio benevolentiae in recalling his youth, and then his all too human yielding to the distractions all writers crave. But of course, this atlas is not a distraction as Mr. Burnham's son has also pointed out, for it represents the very core of his thought in this first chapter, which introduces the theme of the rapid decline of Western civilization. His ability to focus with unsentimental clarity on this image sets the stage for the rest of the book. Above all, I was struck by the sober and coldly objective way he went about outlining what can only be described as impending disaster. 
no four horsemen here, no beast of the apocalypse, but still disaster. Indeed, the terms of engagement in this book are harsh and unsparing. He speaks of the necessity of the will to survive, of the West's suicidal tendency, and provocatively, then and now, of liberalism as the ideology of Western suicide. So we have two extraordinarily drastic kalimit terms, suicide and survival. And Roger <coughs> Kimball also noted some of this. Survival in particular suggests passage through something so terrible as to conjure up the image of the last standing man, or the last man standing, to put it in the right order. I found myself asking, is this what Burnham is marching toward? Is that all there is, as the Peggy Lee song goes? How shall the West survive? What are the forms that that survival will take? But then I return to the epigraph from Spencer's The Fairy Queen that Burnham carefully chose, though he does not identify or comment on the source of the quotation, at least not in the edition that I read. After describing the cave of despair, Spencer has despair rebuked by the Red Cross Knight for provoking the suicide of Sir Towen. And it is Despair himself who speaks in this epigraph, saying, what if some little pain the passage have that makes frail flesh to fear the bitter wave? Is not short pain well born that brings long ease and lays the soul to sleep in quiet grave? Sleep after toil, port after stormy sea, seas, ease after war, death after life does greatly please. Hearing this insidious argument of self-defeat, the knight nearly kills himself, but is saved by the spirit of faith, whereupon despair hangs himself. <laughs> that is the part that comes after. <laughs> My question is, what is the connection between Spencer's figure of despair and the liberalism that Burnham identifies as the ideology of Western suicide? Does he mean us to make this connection? If so, there is great irony and paradox to it or in it. For as Burnham himself declares, liberalism is the optimistic espousal of the perfectibility of human nature, born of rationalism and secularism. But it is the consequences of such utopian thinking, its underlying non-rational basis that may lead us to the cave of despair. All of this tells us something about the moral compass of James Burnham's vision in this book. Now I'm privileged to, and very pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers. R. R. Reno <coughs> is the editor of one of the best journals being published today, First Things, whose public square pages I especially love reading. Um, I was amused to discover online uh, to read that after graduating high school, he spent a year living in a tent in Yosemite Valley, and I'd like to know the story behind that one. <laughs> Many stories. <laughs> okay. Rusty is also a Yaley. He received his PhD in, in religious studies from uh, Yale University and taught theology and ethics at Creighton University in Omaha for 20 years. And notable among his publications are the collection of essays Fighting the Noonday Devil, In the Ruins of the Church, Redemptive Change, Atonement, and the Cure of the Soul, and the co-authored Sanctified Vision, an Introduction to Early Christian Interpretation of the Bible. James Toronto is editor of OpinionJournal.com and is responsible for its popular Best of the Web Today column and very memorable for his sense of humor and pointed commentary. He's a member of the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. He's been with the journal since 1996, after spending five years as an editor at City Journal, the Manhattan Institute's quarterly of urban public policy. He's also worked at the Heritage Foundation, United Press International, Reason Magazine, and elsewhere. And he co-edited the book, Presidential Leadership, Rating the, be the Best, not the Beast, <laughs> Rating the Best and the Worst in the White House in 2004. <laughs> that would be a different story, wouldn't it? A different book. Your title is better. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Ovik Roy is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the Forbes opinion editor, and the author of the Forbes blog, The Apothecary, 
and many readers are familiar with his trenchant criticisms of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. He has also served as an outside advisor to the Romney campaign on health care issues. He's a contributor to National Review Online and the author of the Encounter Broadside, How Medicaid Fails the Poor. And he too is a Yaley, having studied at the Yale University School of Medicine as well as MIT. Please join me now in welcoming our panelists. I guess I start out. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful meditation on Spencer and the Cave of Despair. Uh, I never thought about liberalism hanging itself, uh, <laughs> but I, I rather like that outcome. <laughs> Um, I, I, when I read Suicide of the West, uh, um, it's a, certainly a book that I'm very uh, sympathetic with. After 9-11, I, I took to asking many of my friends who were very concerned about um, Islamic uh, terrorism and, uh, and Islamic um, extremism. I said, what is, the most, what is the greatest threat to the West? And um, when people would hem and haw, they would eventually agree that the West is the greatest threat to the West. And that's, that seems to me to be uh, Burnham's uh, insight. But today I would rather pursue some contentions and provocations with the book uh, in order to stimulate thought and perhaps discussion. So I'm going to talk about what liberalism is. I'm going to take issue with the way that he treats communism. And then I want to talk about um, how I think he may have underestimated um, liberalism. OK, so what is liberalism? Now I. I, my memory's not so good, so I'm not, I don't like to put, uh, boil things down to 39 principles. Three is better to my mind. So I think reading, uh, reading Suicide of the West, um, it crystallized for me what I think are the three features of liberalism. They're not quite the same as Burnham's um, uh, vision, and maybe we can talk about that. I think it was uh, Richard Weaver who said that uh, we operate at three different levels. We have specific beliefs, we have general principles, and we have metaphysical dreams. And I think liberalism is a metaphysical dream, or perhaps more accurately, an anti-metaphysical dream. It dreams of justice, its political dream is a dream of justice without virtue. Its moral dream is a dream of virtue without discipline or censure. And spiritually, it's a dream of self-realization as salvation. To my mind, those are the that's the metaphysical, the threefold metaphysical or anti-metaphysical dream of liberalism. Well, so that was a kind of maybe a provocation in light of uh, his own account of uh, liberalism. So the second issue I want to raise is the, I think, the implausible way, understandable given the book was written in the 1960s, but the implaus implausible way in which Burnham treats communism as anti-Western. Uh, I think it's transparently the case that communism is a contend was a contending force in the West. It was a form of Westernism that was actually extremely effective at conquering a great deal of the world. So I would submit that China today has been Westernized by communism, um, or was Westernized by communism, and that was an indispensable stage in its current uh, development into this sort of authoritarian capitalist uh, society. Certainly the Russia, I think, was westernized by communism. Um, so I think that communism, as we look back, was not, in fact, an anti-Western ideology. It was, it was one of the perversions of the West that uh, was contending for the soul, well, for the future of the world, to use his terminology. And it did a great deal uh, in the 20th century to westernize the political imaginations of nearly the, of, of, of the part of the world where it had dominance. Um, I think, like I said, I think we can see that in retrospect. Also, he turned out to be wrong, I think, about the capacity of liberals to resist and defeat communism. And I think that's because he failed to see, or he, he saw, but sometimes did and sometimes didn't see, certainly the managerial revolution uh, helped, helped me see that the commissar and the liberal technocrat are rivals competing for dominance in the post-traditional West. Uh, so it's really, the, it's really the liberal technocrat 
and the commissar that were at war with each other for dominance after in the post-war era. And that uh, liberalism has techniques for establishing and maintaining power that look, that look weak, that seem weak, but are in fact quite effective. Um, a good example of this, I think, is uh, um, decolonization. I think clearly decolonization served Ameri the, the interests of liberal technocrats in America. Um, non our non-intervention in the Suez Canal crisis in 1956 clearly demonstrated to, to European nations that they were subservient to us, and it was an instrumental move. Our, our non-action was instrumental in establishing American supereminence globally. It, it, uh, it demonstrated that, that the, that the non-Soviet sphere could do nothing without American uh, backing. So decolonization, I think, is um, actually served the interests of a specifically American technocratic elite, um, and which is why we supported it. And so it didn't represent uh, a, our defeat. It was actually part of our, our, our victory in establishing a very different kind of imperium um, globally. Uh, and also the different kinds of ways of maintaining power. I think multiculturalism and domestically is a liberal strategy for managing uh, and maintaining uh, power in, a, in society, a kind of partitioning of, and a parceling out of, um, of goodies in a way of maintaining power. Um, and these appear to be weak, they appear to be anti-Western, they appear to be destructive, they seem to be suicidal, but we know from experience that the institutions like Yale that have adopted its multicultural ideology have not in fact been weakened, uh, but are, are able to uh, actually um, uh, uh, redouble their strength. So I think this brings to my final point, I think the way in which Burnham underestimates liberalism. He's right to say in a number of places that liberalism is not in touch with reality. And I think the example that's most powerful here is, is its gauzy view of the Soviet Union uh, during in the 50s and 60s uh, and into the 70s, that it, uh, it, it, it deceived itself about the true nature of communism for all kinds of reasons. We see this in political correctness, which tends towards, well, quite frankly, uh, the surreal. Um, but we all see that. It seems kind of bizarre in its lack of contact with reality, political correctness. But in fact, it seems to me American liberalism has adjusted itself a great deal since his time. And it's done so in ways to ensure its ongoing viability. Uh, and I think understanding this capacity for adjustment is something we need to do. And I think perhaps this capacity for adjustment stems from the fact that, contra uh, uh, Burnham, American liberalism is not, and using Michael Oakeshott's terminology that he uses in the book, it is not in fact rationalism in politics. It is instead a pragmatic mentality that seems to be capable of almost infinite adjustment. Uh, it's committed to its metaphysical dreams, but its means and, and, and pr its principles are highly plastic. Uh, it's equality, except when it's not. It's freedom, except when it's not. It's tolerance, except when it's not. It's inclusiveness, except when it's not. It's standing strong, except when it doesn't. It's being welcoming and, uh, 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 you know, welcoming and inclusive, except when it's not. It's very difficult, actually, to see what the principles are of contemporary American liberalism. Instead, I think it's a pragmatic set of sensibilities, a set of sensibilities uh, underwritten by or, or, or guided by a kind of pragmatic mentality. Or to put it a little more differently, I think liberalism is an establishment and ruling mentality more than it is a political philosophy. Um, and I would add by way of um, sideline that I think Burnham neglected to recognize that American liberalism is actually connected culturally with um, um, certain strands of mainline Protestantism that it became deracinated in the 70s and 80s. But nevertheless, it has a kind of cultural base that gives it a kind of stability and content and um, capacity to perpetuate itself that, uh, that, that helps it overcome it, the weakness of its own ersatz principles. So, Finally, it seems to me that if liberalism triumphs globally, and it may, no, nothing ever finally completely triumphs, but it may succeed in becoming the dominant global mentality, that if it does that, this may represent the suicide of humanity, but it won't represent 
the suicide of the West. It will represent the triumph of a certain faction within the West, a certain tradition within the West. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have a uh, better memory than our moderator does, because when I was asked to be on this panel, I distinctly and vividly recalled that I'd never read Suicide of the West. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And of course, as I was reading, I, I was comparing Burnham's description of the liberal of 1964 with the liberals that we see in 2014. And uh, I think his description held up probably on the whole better than I would have expected. Uh, but there were two very glaring differences that I noticed. And one of them is that in the past 50 years, liberalism has completely rejected freedom of speech as a principle. Now, if you think that's an exaggeration, uh, I suggest you read the text of Senate Joint Resolution 19. This is a constitutional amendment introduced by Senator Tom Udall of New Mexico. Uh, he has 48 co-sponsors, all Democrats. Uh, a 49th Democrat voted for it in the Judiciary Committee, and all 55 Democrats currently in the Senate uh, have voted for it at least on procedural motions. Uh, those, that, those numbers are going to decline some next year, but not because any of the Democrats have changed their minds. <laughs> uh, this uh, this uh, uh, amendment is a uh, response to the Citizens United case, which held that uh, independent expenditures could not be regulated, I, I, which is a case of campaign finance law coming up head on with, against the rights of free speech, and particularly upsetting to the left that corporations have the same free speech rights as individuals. But this proposed amendment would go far beyond uh, I, reversing Citizens United. What it says is Congress or state legislatures can pass any reasonable regulation on the spending of money by individuals or organizations to influence an election. Now, the crucial thing here is the evil that the Supreme Court has always recognized as justifying some restrictions on, restrictions on campaign finance is corruption, buying politicians or buying access. This is not about corruption. This is about persuasion. This is about seeking to change the minds of the voters. It's core political speech. And I think that the Democrats are for this, not because they think it will be to their advantage as Democrats. I think they're for it on ideological grounds. So I think that this makes the rejection of free speech total. Now, Roger Kimball talked earlier about political correctness, and that is a better way of examining the psychology of the rejection of free speech. Because I, what you see is, you know, somebody, I think it was Robert Frost who said that uh, a liberal is, uh, uh, a liberal is a man too broad-minded to take his own side in a quarrel. <laughs> nobody would say that. No, nobody would say that about liberals in 2014, right? And it's, it's not just the, the understanding of free speech that Burnham describes of the, that the liberals in his day have, and a few old ones do today, uh, was not just a legalistic understanding. It was a, it was a social and cultural understanding. It was the idea that you know, everyone's entitled to his opinion. The other fellow has a right to, to speak his piece, uh, and you know the answer to speech is more speech and all that. Well, they don't, they don't believe that anymore. I mean, look at uh, what happened to Brendan Eich, the guy who was uh, driven out of his job because he supported the initiative against uh, same-sex marriage in California. Look at the attacks on uh, Ayanna Hirsi Ali or the uh, incident that uh, John O'Sullivan described earlier, which I assume had something to do with uh, his uh, political speech, although he didn't specify what, uh, what, what the provocation was. Uh, and so, you know, I guess the question is why, and I suppose I would say uh, there are two reasons. One is it's a show of dominance. Uh, you know, if, if you have the power to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, shut your opponents up. You're going to use it. If you don't have the power, you'll appeal to free speech. Uh, the left, they may not have the political power, the legal power, but they have the cultural power. On the other hand, I think it's also a sign of vulnerability because uh, they feel threatened by uh, the expression of, uh, of dissenting views. And uh, I think we've seen that quite a bit, uh, particularly during the Obama administration, where you know all critics of the president are denounced as racist and, uh, and so on and so forth. The other area in which, uh, I, I should say, uh, Burnham did foretell that liberals might eventually abandon free speech. And I'll go into that a bit after I talk about the second way in which today's liberals are very different. And that is, Burnham said almost nothing about sex. 
Now, I mean that, I mean that in both senses of the word sex, in the roles of men and women in society, and also in sexual relationships and sexual freedom and so forth. And I, there has obviously been vast social change in both of these areas in the past 50 years. And I would pinpoint two policy decisions, more or less contemporaneous with the publication of the book, that were really the spur to this social change. I don't think this was driven by liberalism, and uh, Burnham's omission of it is, a, uh, uh, is an indication of that. But I think liberalism has adapted to it and, uh, and made it really central to the ideology. One is the FDA's approval of the pill as a uh, form of contraception in 1960, which it seems to me enabled the sexual revolution. It enabled sexual freedom in a way that was just not possible before. Uh, and the other is uh, the Civil Rights Act, which included an amendment uh, that extended its protections to women. It was originally intended as a, uh, as a bar to racial discrimination. The sex amendment was introduced mischievously by a congressman named uh, Howard W. Smith, who was a Virginia segregationist. Uh, some people argue that he was sincere in his devotion to feminist principles. There is historical disagreement about that. But it's pretty well agreed that his, one of his aims was to scuttle the bill because he thought he would embarrass people into either voting against it or, or they would vote for it and then they would be embarrassed into voting down the bill. Instead, they voted for it and then they approved the bill. So perhaps he was too clever by half. Uh, but we've had vast emergent social change ever since that to which the liberals have adapted. And this has really become, it seems to me, uh, the central core of liberalism. And I think that it has been the most, uh, that, that these two changes in tandem have had more of an effect uh, on, our, on our culture and our politics than, than anything else that's happened domestically in the past 50 years, because it affects the structure of the family, it affects uh, uh, the welfare state, it affects fertility rates, illegitimacy rates, which in turn I, I place more uh, demands for uh, expanding the welfare state and also uh, I put strains on the welfare state. It's just been, uh, it's just been uh, uh, overwhelming. And, and, and Burnham failed to foresee that. And I, I don't know that anyone uh, could have. Uh, I'll close by coming back to the uh, Ion Hersey Ali case, which I was talking about with Noel before the panel began. Uh, and uh, Noel said to me, I, I don't understand how feminists cannot support somebody like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's speaking up for women's equality and, and women's freedom in, uh, uh, in uh, Muslim countries. And I said, well, I, I think Burnham explained that, and I, I'll explain it in, in my talk, which is uh, he has this chapter, you may recall, in which he talks about the four sort of broad political values and how the differences in worldviews come down to a difference in how one ranks these values. We all value these things, but some of us value some of them more than others. And his ranking for the liberal one was as follows. The uppermost priority was peace, followed by justice, followed by freedom, followed by liberty. And the distinction between liberty and freedom is freedom is personal freedom, liberty is national freedom or sovereignty. So liberty is, is beside the point. But let's think about this. So the left used to embrace free speech. That was their idea of freedom. Now their idea of freedom is sexual freedom. Uh, we have competing claims of justice, which is their second most important value. Uh, Ali is speaking on behalf of justice for women. Her detractors are speaking on behalf of justice for Muslims, who are a supposedly oppressed minority. Uh, and the reason that the claim on behalf of Muslims ends up trumping in the liberal mind the claim on behalf of women is because of that topmost value, peace, because the uh, claim of justice on behalf of a potential or actual adversary of America or the West outweighs the claim of peace or freedom, or the claim of justice on behalf of uh, half of humanity, some of whom are uh, uh, Westerners and some of whom aren't. Uh, and so there's the answer to your question. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Ovik, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Thanks, James. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and I also want to uh, thank uh, the Buckley program for that, that beautiful moment earlier this semester when we all got to watch Ion Hersey Ali come to this campus and resist the pressure, <laughs> such intense pressure. 
to, uh, to scuttle that invitation or water it down in some way. Uh, uh, we all, I think all of us, uh, uh, were very appreciative of that. And uh, I also want to thank John O'Sullivan for bringing up that moment from, what was it, 16 years ago when he got carted out of the room. I was there. Um, I remember his hair was flopping in the wind as they carted him out of the room, and I was actually tasked that day or that evening by the Speaker of the Yale Political Union with preventing a, a mob of marauding Koreans from breaking that door down with two by fours to get into uh, this hall and, and attack uh, Mr. O'Sullivan. So that was North a day. Koreans? Uh, no, uh, South Koreans. Uh, <laughs> it was it was not a day that you uh, you would ever forget. It doesn't happen every day. Uh, uh, but, uh, but of course, today, uh, we're not expecting uh, mobs of, uh, of marauding Koreans to break down the door, but, uh, but that's actually kind of relevant to, to our, our, our subject for, for today. Um, I actually want to echo something that, that some of the earlier panelists on the stage mentioned, which is that uh, Burnham's book, The Managerial Revolution, is, in my mind, uh, the book that has the most profound implications for today. If you think about uh, how the state has grown in the United States and across uh, the West. What has been the driver of the growth? So of, course it's, of course, it's been government spending, a federal or state involvement in the economy. But I think our, our movement has done a reasonably good job of holding the line on, say, taxes. If you look at tax revenue to the government, to the federal government at least, as a percentage of economic output of GDP, it's been relatively constant over the last 50, 60 years, since World War II. Spending has certainly gone up. Uh, but the biggest growth in uh, the, the scale and scope of state activity has been actually regulation. And it's something that uh, the conservative movement has not really done a good job of addressing. We've had books like Burnham's that talk about it. We, we certainly complain about it. We express skepticism about regulation. But there has been no coherent uh, approach or attack or uh, action against the growth of the regulatory state. And I think there's a reason for that. I think, I think that if we think about the conservative movement since World War II, we've done a great job of producing thinkers and philosophers. We'll take, I know there's an argument as to which term uh, you want to use between Steve and Roger, <laughs> but we'll take your pick. And, and, and there's been, there's been uh, you know, a lot of great prose stylists, uh, but we have not necessarily done a great job of producing people who are able to fight on the battlefield of how to change regulations and steer the regulatory state uh, in a freer direction. And I think there's an understandable reason why. It's really, really, really boring, right? <laughs> you know, in 1926, uh, the Federal Register, which is the, the, the book that the federal government puts out every year with all the lists of regulatory notices, is about 2,600 pages. In 2012, it was 78,900 pages. Uh, and Obamacare alone has had something like 20,000 pages of regulation. People talk about the bill being 2,800 pages. It's actually the regulations that are another 20,000, 20, 30,000 pages that are the bulk of how uh, Obamacare changes America. The federal spending in Obamacare is what we all talk about. But actually, the federal government is so heavily involved in the health care system already through the great society programs of Medicare and Medicaid. Obamacare's impact on federal spending on health care is relatively modest. It actually only increases federal spending on health care by about 15%, which is not nothing. It's not the right direction. But where Obamacare is a step change from the old system is that it introduces a layer of regulation, federal regulation, into the health insurance market that dra dramatically changes the way health insurers and, uh, can operate in this country and the kinds of choices that we can all have in, in how we pay for and, and consume health care. So, so the regulatory state is, is, is a huge, huge problem, and it's been a huge deficiency in our movement. I'm not sure how we, we reorient our movement or try to do something to make sure that we're, that we're uh, building a cadre of, of regulatory ninjas who can go out there and fight these battles. Um, and maybe ninjas is not the right metaphor, right? Because in a sense, <laughs> what, we, what, we've, uh, what we've done uh, on our side is we, we, we tend to say, well, we shouldn't even, if we produce our own regulatory experts who can fight that battle, they're technocrats too. We, and they're, they're going to be technocrats of the right, and that's just bad. The government has no legitimate role in any of this stuff, and we should just keep saying that. Well, we can keep saying that, but while we keep saying that, the regulatory state keeps advancing. And so we haven't found a way to navigate that divide between saying, you know what, we're, a, we're in principle against regulation. We know that re regulation tends to be economically inefficient. And yet, 
we have to actually have a plan, a game plan, or an approach to actually rolling back or reforming the regulatory state and making that regulatory state smaller. So you can say, it's fine and well to say, well, the federal government should have no role in health care. That's great. You know, I, I've read the Constitution, too. But the problem is the federal government is spending $1 trillion a year on health care, driven by 50,000 pages of regulations. And unless we figure out a politically plausible way to address that problem, we're never going to actually enjoy a freer health care system, the, the kind that we all, all want and espouse. Um, and this leads me to the second half of what I want to talk about, which is this issue of is, is the, is the, is there, should there be a suicide watch for the West? Um, and and uh, you know, I, I thought that Rusty brought up a beautiful point about how communism is actually a Western idea. Right? So we have to actually step back and define our terms. What is the West? Is the West the ideas that come out of the West? If so, the entire world is Western in one form or another, most of it at least. I mean, yes, uh, maybe you could say that ISIS is, is not really Western in, 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 its, in its politics, but certainly in their use of technology, uh, they're quite Western, actually. Um, capitalism, yes, it's a, an idea that originated in the West, but you could argue that it's actually Asian city-states that are the preeminent practitioners of capitalism around the world. Uh, if you look at the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom, the two countries at the top of that list are Hong Kong and Singapore, right? Uh, so we actually have a lot to learn, perhaps, from the geographic East uh, when we think about how to uh, apply and advance the values and interests of the West. Uh, if, if we're talking about the West in terms of a, a set of countries where historically white Europeans have inhabited, well, I guess we can, we can express concern about that, but that's, that's, I don't think that's why we're here. I think we're here not to talk about particular ethnic groups and whether they will continue to be the most prosperous ethnic groups in the world. We're here to talk about a set of ideas, and I think those ideas are not only advancing uh, around the world, but are triumphant uh, because and I think this is something that, 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 that Burnham reminds us of. Burnham writing about the future of the West is a bit like, say, John Locke writing about the future of the West in, uh, in, the, in the late 18th century or perhaps earlier. At the time, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time of the Enlightenment, which of course was a liberal movement, small l, rebelling against the conservatism of, say, uh, you know, Roman Catholicism uh, or, or uh, a more aristocratic forms of government, we did not yet know, fully understand at that time, what the Industrial Revolution was going to do to the West. And I think today we're at a similar point. The information age, the information revolution that we're undergoing is transforming the whole world in a way that those of us who've been brought up to think about the world in an industrialized sense have not fully grasped. And those, those in our movement who fought the battles against communism in the 20th century, let's not forget, that debate between capitalism and communism in the 20th century was a battle about industrial societies, right? And, and, and a society, the society that we're evolving towards, a society in which the information economy <coughs> is more important than the industrial economy, is one that's going to advance not in a straight line, not some in Hegelian straight line through history. It's going to evolve in ways we can't predict. I think one thing that's very interesting is, if you think about it, some of the greatest capitalists of our era, people like Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg are political liberals, right? So, so the greatest capitalists, you know, we, we all say that we're for capitalism. Why is it that some of the greatest capitalists of our time are political liberals? And remember, these are also people who are globalists, typically. They're internationally oriented, uh, like uh, you know, James Burnham critiqued liberalism as being uh, something that looked down on, on, on nationalism and displays of patriotism. Most of the su super successful capitalists that I know uh, are the same way, actually. They, uh, they're not uh, rah-rah uh, Americans. They have a global perspective in which they look at each country and they look at the pluses and minuses of each and are trying to do business everywhere, including Red China, right? And of course, uh, China, the People's Republic of China, is moving in a, in a more uh, a capitalist direction in certain ways, perhaps a cronious capitalist direction uh, with less political freedom. Uh, but, but it's not at all clear that the West is failing. If anything, if, you, if, you, if we were at a similar conference on the left, they would be fulminating about the triumph 
of the West and the triumph of capitalism and how uh, a, a capitalist uh, and corporatist ideas have taken over the world and how uh, ideas of equality are, are being uh, demolished as a result. Right? So yes, is the state trying to do more to enforce a kind of economic equality? Yes. But under uh, this president, economic inequality has actually increased. Part of the reason is his policies. But part of the reason is the information economy. So we live in a world where successful entrepreneurs, because of global markets, can now make billions of dollars when before they might make tens of millions of dollars. Where the people who are very successful and who can actually navigate the information economy, college educated elites, are doing extremely well. But the, the, the so-called blue collar worker that we knew so much about or talked so much about in the 20th century, his role in this new economy is not clear. And so as we think about Burnham's uh, thought process, and if Burnham were writing a similar book today, what would he be concerned about? I would argue he would be very concerned about the regulatory state, and he would also be trying to think hard about how the information economy is transforming political orders around the world in ways that both uh, uh, advance our values in ways that may work against our values, but, but, but principally I'd say that the set of political problems we have today are very different. Because uh, liberalism in the, in the John Stuart Mill sense has some limitations in a world where it used to be, in the industrial economy, if you worked hard you'd get ahead, right? You worked hard, you just supplied yourself, anyone could get a good job if you worked. That's still true, we still believe in that concept. But in a world where certain people who are just brighter than other people are going to have a fundamental advantage in an information economy, we have to think about how we are going to uh, address uh, th those disparities. Is it really going to be true? Are people, average people going to believe in 2030 that if you work hard, you have an equal chance of getting ahead as someone who has a degree from Yale? Uh, it's not exactly clear. But broadly speaking, I think we have a lot of reason to be optimistic. The world is, is different today than it was then. As James mentioned, sexual mores are very different than they were 50 years ago. But economic prosperity throughout the world is advancing because of Western values. Just in the last 20 years, a billion people around the world have been lifted out of poverty because of Western values. Hundreds of millions of people have been liberated from totalitarian political systems. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of, of the suicide of the West. We're also this week, of course, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And efforts by governments to regulate the information economy have proven thus far not to be that successful. That could change. But that is at least a source for us to be optimistic that Western values not only are growing around the world, uh, but that, that they will remain and, and become even more triumphant a, a generation from now than they were a generation ago. Thank you. Thank you very much for that most in interesting and stimulating panel. Now, um, we're open with the time that remains. We do have some time for questions, and uh, maybe I could just start, and then you could also pitch in <laughs> to this discussion. Um, I had a number of questions, but I guess one that I wanted to ask was, um, I think it was Adams who said there was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. <laughs> uh, and though he says, he goes on to say that all forms of government are subject to the same vulnerabilities because of human frailty. Um, his comment, nevertheless, it certainly resonates with me and, and when I think of it as juxtaposed to Burnham's understanding of liberalism. I don't think Burnham quotes Adam, uh, Adams in the book uh, on this matter, but my question is to what degree are they speaking of the same thing or not speaking of the same thing? And I leave this to any one of you if you'd like to comment on it. <laughs> well, it's interesting that, uh, that American democracy hasn't committed suicide 200 plus years uh, later. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, I think it, it, it's a testimony to the fact that, um, that there's a, we, ha we have a society with a lot of social capital um, that, and we have a, 
we have a democratic system that right now is paralyzed because, uh, in my analysis, uh, it accurately reflects the ambivalence of the country with, as, with respect to really deep questions about what kind of society we want to be. So I, I think we have a system that's actually pretty darn representative. Um, and it's dysfunctional because our, our society is, is a kind of an equipoise um, between two different, two different visions uh, uh, of the future. It's easy in a place like Yale to feel like the liberals have uh, run everything. Uh, but uh, I, I was with a friend of mine in New York who was really just down, down, down. I said, man, you got to go to Texas sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, and I, I actually just got back a couple of weeks ago from a trip to Singapore, and I can tell you it was eye-opening. I mean, the, the, ener the capitalist energy in Asia right now is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Their sense of the possibility of what they can do to make the people around them more prosperous is just, it's, I can't even describe it. It made me feel like our arguments and our debates in, in this country are so petty and so small mm -hmm. uh, relative to what's going on there. Now, politically, the, their political orders are not generally very democratic. Right, uh, and so that leads us to a, we don't have to get into the side discussion of whether the political freedom and economic freedom are necessarily uh, correlative and, and, and coexistent. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say the problem we have is actually not so much a democratic problem; it's a Madisonian problem. All right, we have a system that was designed and has succeeded in making it very hard to change laws in terms of the statutory laws passed by Congress. But because in those b few brief moments where uh, progressives had overwhelming power, such as in 2010 and in 1965. Uh, they have passed laws that have then been become entrenched. It's been very, very hard to unravel those laws, and the regulatory managerial state has taken over. Um, and I think that's something we, we have to think about hard, is in, in a world where in a, I don't think the, the, the framers believed that in, in uh, the, the system they were devising would put limited government at a disadvantage. But arguably, it has because in those few moments, uh, the, the the progressives have been able to stall their system, uh, and conservatives have not been able to uh, reverse that because of Madisonian checks and balances on their temporary moments of power. But as Steve Hayward pointed out before, uh, the uh, left's reaction to uh, this. Uh, midterm election was to, the New York Times published this op-ed saying, cancel midterm elections. <laughs> uh, and th th this, I guess this was actually- History has not spoken. Th this is right. <laughs> th this, this was the day before the election. And their argument was, we have these midterm elections, and gee, it makes it hard for the president to govern. And I, so it really, democracy is the corrective here rather than the problem. They'll change their mind when there's a Republican president. <laughs> well, they did. Of I mean, they, they, they took the, uh, there were despairs about the future of America from the left uh, for much of the Bush, uh, the yeah. Bush years too, and the Reagan years as well for that matter. Could I just pile on on one thing? In terms of this question about the regulatory state, I think that we're stuck with it, it's going to get bigger, and it's going to, and the real question is who gets to run it? Uh, um, and that's going to be, if we, can, if we can run it, we can, we can make it somewhat less burdensome. And it's going to get bigger because as uh, traditional norms for organizing people's lives recede in their, in their power and influence over people's lives, we have to impose a kind of bureaucratic, therapeutic, legal mechanism to organize people's lives. And we see this at, in a small way on university campuses. We, we sort of tossed out the norms for male-female relations. Uh, and amidst all the disorder, lots of bad things are happening. And so now we have to have a kind of legalized system in order to impose some order. And I think as the family declines in the United States, we're going to get um, we're going to we're going to get a we're going to get a resulting growth uh, in government to compensate. People have to have prosthetics for the family, and those prosthetics have to be administered. It's very complicated, and so we're going to wind up regulating the intimate life. Um, in, order to, in order to compensate for our deregulation de of the intimate life in the sexual revolution. I'd like to open this up for, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I see one of the major problems uh, as education. The people really do not have an understanding or appreciation of capitalism, the free market. Now, education to me falls into two broad categories. One is academic and the other is what people get from the media. 
And I'd be interested to know what your views are as to why in both quadrants the predominant thinking is so liberal. I'll just jump in here because I, I actually think that uh, I would actually disagree with the premise of the question. I think the millennial generation is extremely capitalistic. Uh, there's very much an entrepreneur. Everyone wants to go to Stanford. Stanford yes. has now become the school with the, the lowest admissions company. rate uh, in, the, in terms of colleges in the United States because everyone wants to become a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually think that that, uh, that, that has become a, a very ex exciting development in a lot of senses. Now, where there is deficiency perhaps is in the, the sense of classical education civic education, a sense of what our cons why our constitution, our political traditions come from. I think that's where uh, our education, so not just in political uh, tradition, but the, the Western canon uh, and, 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 and the Western intellectual tradition, those are the things where, uh, where we are suffering. But, but I would say, at least on, on the issue of entrepreneurship, uh, I think there's a lot of reason to believe, a lot of reason to have optimism about, about the rise of generation. Well, I, I think it's, I think the university is easy to explain. The university is the progressive church um, because progressives don't go to church. Uh, so if they want to transmit their values to their children, how are they gonna do it? They have to control educational institutions in order to transmit their values to their children. Um, so I think it's, there's a prof there are profound structural reasons why the university culture is left of left um, and not center left. And that's because, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative Catholic. If I want to transmit my values to the next generation, I can give money to the church, I can identify uh, traditionalist Catholic organizations to give money to, or the Knights of Columbus, or maybe the Masonic Lodge. I mean, there are lots of intermediating institutions in America are almost all on the conservative side. And so progressives don't have mediating institutions to transmit their values to their kids. They have to control public education. They have to control elite universities. Another reason is that people who appreciate capitalism by and large become capitalists. They go into business. And uh, so I, you know, there's a self-selection issue. Uh, I'm a bit of an oddball in that I appreciate capitalism and I decided to become a journalist. But, and there, you know, I, I know other people like me, but, but I'm an outlier. Yeah, this question of regulation that Avic raised and RR commented on, look, I think there's three problems to it. It needs to be broken into three parts. One is, um, I actually think there are a lot of regulatory ninjas. That's the phrase I use, by the way. I like that one. There aren't enough of them, but they do have an effect sometimes. Uh, but the broader difficulty that where I think things fail is part number two, which is, comes from Burnham. There is a class interest in the whole form of the regulatory state or the administrative state. And that's where there has not been, I agree with you completely, there hasn't been any serious thinking or development of a broad political thought on this, on how to resist it, how to turn it back. Burnham, after all, was merely describing it, saying this is the future. He didn't have an answer for this, really. Mm -hmm. And so the third yeah. problem is the one that, that our arc brings up, which is, Shouldn't there be some kind of conservative regulatory philosophy, broadly speaking, except for dogmatic, I call them utopian libertarians. Very few conservatives think there should be no regulation, but what are the forms of it and how is it, should it be bounded? It seems to me that that's the big challenge for conservative uh, political leaders and thinkers today, and I agree with you completely, it's not being very well done. Well, we could, we could have a whole conference on that, on that topic, mm -hmm. Steve, so I'll, I'll do my best to uh, abbreviate my answer accordingly. Uh, I would say a couple of things. I, I think it actually goes back to what James was just saying. There's a, there's a self-selection with the regulators, right? The regulators are generally the people who want to regulate. Do you think that regulation is, a, is an attractive mechanism for, for, for uh, more regulation is attractive? I will say something else, though. I think here's where our movement in the United States could learn a lot more from uh, Burkean and Humean conservatism as opposed to purely being about economic liberalism. Because what, what, how would Burke inform our, our thinking about a, a regulatory state? He would say, uh, we have to be gradual in the way we reform things, not disruptive, but we have to be also rigorously, rigorously empirical. Uh, and, and, and so what is that, how, does that, how does that frame your philosophy of regulation? Quite a, quite a number of ways, right? Uh, we have to think about regulatory tests. So a lot of times what happens with regulation today is a bunch of people in a room say, you know, oh yeah, let's just regulate X, and they never think about the cost benefit of that regulation. They're not, they're not required to by law, and there's no oversight of the cost benefit of regulations, which again sounds very wonky and technocratic, but it's one of the few ways we can govern uh, regulations in order to think through, have at least an empirical framework 
for thinking through, are these regulations going to destroy the economy? Are they going to make businesses drop out of a particular market? Or are they going to encourage more competition and, 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 a, and a more prosperous economy? We at least have to think about that uh, and use that as, as a way to address things. And Burke actually has another way, uh, a lesson for us in this regard, in that so much of what we think about conservatism, small c, <coughs> it's, it's a lot of it is about, if you look at what, Europe, what, what does conservatism mean in Europe? A lot of it means elitism. Right? It's, it's an old aristocratic idea, which is now in most uh, modern Western European countries uh, resulted in sort of, it's not so much aristocrats, it's partly aristocrats, it's also these capitalist or economic corporatist families that hand down their big gigantic businesses to their kids and, and avoid all the rules that everyone else um, uh, has to adhere to. And this is uh, where uh, the regulatory state and sort of Burkeanism or, or Burkean ideas can help us think through things because Part of what we are now fighting against in terms of this overweening regulatory state is a kind of conservatism. It's a, well, if you deregulate things, it's going to be disruptive. If you deregulate things, people might be hurt. We just don't know. What, we, can't, we can never have a free health care system. Who, who has one of those? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's so much better if we experts, we, like Jonathan Gruber the other day, you know, all those <laughs> stupid American voters who don't understand, we have to do these things for them because they're too stupid to figure it out for themselves. That, that elitism, again, in a small c sense, uh, it, it betrays a kind of conservative impulse. So liberal elitism uh, is something that we have to figure out a way against. Because populism alone does not, does never succeeds in fighting elites. There's a reason why elites are called elites, because they have more resources, more influence, more power. Uh, and populists, even in a, in a democratic country, can't always easily fight back against elites. So we have to figure out some sort of language that allows to, to, to appeal to that elite class and say, guys, freedom is actually better than status regulation. I don't, I don't have that fully fleshed out as an answer, but, but these are hard problems, and that's why we haven't solved them. There, there is actually an office in the federal government, uh, yes, the one is. that Cass Sunstein headed, uh, that uh, is supposed to apply cost-benefit analysis and, uh, and uh, apparently and sometimes succeeds in putting the kibosh on regulation. I read, I was, I, I happen to have been reading an article in Harper's of all places on the train up here by Robert Kuttner, who's just outraged at the whole concept. It was a review of a couple of Sunstein's books, but he said that the, that, that this office was created during the Carter administration and the Reagan administration actually put it to some good use or bad use in Kuttner's view. <laughs> I'm afraid we don't have any more time, unless, I, I assume you want to stick to your schedule? Rich? <laughs> we can do one more. Let's do one okay, more. Okay, good. Yeah, good. one more. We Let's have ramble. one more. <laughs> good. Thanks very much. I like the panelists, I like it if the panelists could address two trends they've touched on briefly, namely the, uh, the contraction of religious faith and the collapse of the two-parent family in the Western world. One, are those trends as robust as they seem to be and if so, can the things we cherish and value in Western culture survive them? The, the percent of people who go to church every Sunday has not changed in the last 50 years. It's around 25 to 35 percent of the American population. One of my sociologist friends says that it's probably been true for about 100 years. What has changed dramatically is a number of people who consider themselves to have no religious affiliation, which is now around 20 percent of the population. They're driving the culture war now. Uh, they are the religious, the, the a-religious uh, left of the 21st century. They're the equivalent of the religious right in the, as they emerge in the 1980s. They're, they're tired of having to put up with the, residu the residuum of a Christian nation, and they're not going to put up with it anymore. Um, that's, that creates the impression of a decline of religious faith. What it really is is a transformation uh, of what people who were not really religious, but who still kind of acquiesced to the dominance of Christian values in America. And that's the big change. So I think we, can, we shouldn't read this as a decline in religious faith. It's a decline in the influence of religious faith over the majority of the population. I think it's a decline in the influence of religious faith over the elites. Oh, especially, uh, yes. Because I, you mentioned the religious right, and I think the evangelical side of this has been growing. And so you have, I mean, maybe we're becoming more polarized around religion uh, would be the way to put it. Uh, I don't think that the trend away from the nuclear family is going away anytime soon. I think that's driven primarily by technological and economic changes. Uh, I think it's actually separate from the religious question. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, Coming Apart, Charles Murray's book, mm -hmm. uh, 
the uh, well, actually, he points out that the uh, the uh, what the more educated the fish uh, Belmont, as he calls them, uh, are more religious in terms of going to church and also more uh, more uh, uh, much likelier to have stay, uh, intact families. Uh, but I don't know that they're more religious. And I mean, I don't. I, I think the the, the uh, they may have a, more, a greater concentration of Reformed Jews, mainline Protestants, and that sort of thing. Uh, they're certainly more liberal in their, uh, in their political and social outlooks. Uh, as one of my friends said, uh, marriage is doing just fine in the upper middle class. They talk the talk of the 60s, but they walk the walk of the 50s. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the great problems in our society is not income inequality. I mean, there are problems associated with that, but it's the, it's the marriage inequality that is a problem. Now, I think that gay marriage is a luxury good for the rich that's going to be paid for by the poor because it, it cannot help but um, undermine the symbolic uh, meaning of marriage um, because it puts an exclamation point on the sexual revolution. Now, I know that's a controversial thing to say, but I, I believe that this is a serious problem. Anybody who's committed to limited government should be very, very worried about the future of the family and the future of marriage because uh, the, uh, the family is the ultimate social safety net. And if that is not functional, then government will intervene. People will demand that somebody take care of them. I think single women vote, Demo uh, vote Democrats so strongly because they feel vulnerable. Uh, they don't feel as though they have they have a network or they have a reliable basis for the future of their lives. Uh, they don't feel secure. And um, so I think we should be very, very, very concerned about marriage and the family. Uh, whatever your moral views are, you should be very, very concerned about uh, the future of the family if you're concerned about limited government. I want to be uh, more pessimistic and more optimistic uh, than my colleagues for, for a second. If, if you look at it's always good to look at Western Europe in a lot of these areas, and I will echo the point about the disparities here. Actually, the divorce rate, this is an interesting statistic you might not know. The divorce rate for college-educated couples in the United States is 10 percent. So if both the, 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 the bride and the groom are, are college educate, have college degrees, the divorce rate is 10 percent. And there's been some theories as to why that is. Uh, but, but among the elites, uh, the, the family has not really broken down here. However, in Europe, it definitely has. So if you look at, say, Scandinavia, uh, where there actually is a considerable amount of social order uh, and economic prosperity and economic freedom, there has been a complete breakdown of the family. It's very common for well, upper well, middle class. I, I want to intervene here. In France, you're more likely to grow up with your natural parents than in the United States. So the French don't marry, but they stay together yeah. and they raise their that, kids. That's, a, that's absolutely so, right. So there's a, there's, a breakdown, there's a breakdown in formal marriage, but often there's cohabitating couples with children that stay together for long periods of time. Uh, and, and the reason I bring that up is, is precisely to say that, that while, while the, the, the formal characteristic of how we think about a, a traditional community in which people go to church on Sunday and they have a formal marriage and then they live in this fair, fairly legal entity, that, that may uh, erode over time. Again, if you look at Western Europe as the future, if you look at a country like Norway or Denmark where Christianity is official state religion, people pay taxes to the church, uh, yet uh, that there is this family breakdown. But there has not been a breakdown in social order. I think we've all assumed because of our experience in this country that family breakdown necessarily leads to social order. There may be a way out of that conundrum. And, and, and the reason why I make that argument uh, as well is Think about this. What's, one, what's the fundamental difference between conservatives and liberals? As was mentioned earlier, it's that liberals believe in the perfectibility of human, humanity and human nature, whereas conservatives believe that human nature is constant and immutable. And so if you think about the fact that human nature is constant and immutable, and you realize that people have been living in family structures since the time immemorial, right? And the reason why religious truth has, has been so enduring is for that reason. We have every reason to be optimistic that whatever the political conditions or the economic conditions or the social conditions we may endure or face 50 years from now, that people's need and desire to be in families and communities will endure because that's ingrained in who we are. But if the breakdown of the family in Europe is just a formal breakdown, that is people don't have the piece of paper, but they're living together more or less as if they were married and staying together for life or some approximation thereof, then I don't know that that suggests a way out if the breakdown has, uh, is, is more than formal here. I don't, I don't know that, that that suggests a remedy. It just suggests a, a 
disease that we have that they don't have? It, I, I would just call it a, it, it, it's, it's going to get, the, the, the formal problem that we describe is going to get worse, but the consequences of that problem may not be as catastrophic as we fear. And on that more positive or somewhat <laughs> positive note, thank you very much. <laughs>